Lamentation chapter 5, or actually chapter 4 and 5 tonight. Lamentations chapter 4 and 5. Let's pause just for a moment of prayer once again. Father, we ask that you would bless your word to our, the hearing. That, Lord, as we hear, it would produce faith as your word has promised it would. You said that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we pray that you'd bless our hearing tonight. May we hear the spirit of God working, moving, leading, guiding our lives. Revealing Jesus Christ even more to us this evening through your word. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, the book of Lamentation. We're going to finish it tonight, and I believe that God has a special blessing for those that go through the book of Lamentation. Because there's not much joy in it. <laughs> it is just one sorrow after another, and, and, uh, and I, as I was talking about it tonight, I think the Holy Spirit put the book of Lamentation right where it's at. So you're really looking forward to going to the book of Ezekiel when you go on to the next book, as we will next week. And, but I thank God for you guys that have come out on Thursday nights to go through the book of Lamentation. And I believe God's going to bless you as you've gone through this book. Let's pick it up in chapter 4. And let's start with the background. As, as you already know, if you've been with us, Jeremiah is sitting off in the distance of the city of Jerusalem, watching it burn, watching the demolishment of, of the city, the destruction of the city, as the Babylonians are carrying away the children of, of Israel into captivity. He's watched the women be ravished, raped. He's watched the children starve to death. He's watched the young men and the women and the, and the old men die of starvation, be killed by the sword. And literally, Jeremiah is in shock. There are times where you and I have been exposed to things that shock us. Um, and when we see something that's just absolutely not natural to see, our minds often will click off or go into a, a phase of, we call it shock, of, of, of masking something or, or whatever and, and, and uh, when you see somebody in an accident or somebody see at a, a, a murder site or something violent happen um, people go into shock they, 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 that's how our bodies deal with, with things that aren't natural and Jeremiah has been watching for the last 18 months as the city of Jerusalem has been besieged by the Babylonians, he has been watching people starve to death, women eating their own children, children starving and dying of thirst because of the lack of milk that the mother has in her own breast. The temple and the city destroyed, burned, ruined, torn down. The strong men, the mighty men, laying in the streets dead. It's a horrible, horrible thing that he's seen and he's describing and he's mourning and, and the book of Lamentations is, is Jeremiah dealing with it, sorting it all out, trying to make sense of the senseless. And he's wrestling with his faith and the sense that he's, he's seen, he's, he's, he's going, 
in a sense, he's, he's, he's wondering, has God just totally and utterly forsaken us? And he's trying to make sense of it. And so in chapter 4, he, he starts off and he says, How is the, the gold become dim? And how is the most fine gold changed? The stones of the sanctuary poured out into the top of every street. He's referring to the temple of Solomon, this wonder of the world. Writers of those days says that if you hadn't seen Solomon's temple, you haven't seen anything. Because it was the most beautiful building structure ever imagined. You remember the Queen of Sheba when she came from that northern Africa area. When she came and she heard Solomon's wisdom and saw all that he did and then his table and, and this magnificent temple. She said, the half wasn't even told to me. I mean, now I've seen it all. I've heard it. I've experienced it. Now I can, I, I'm back. I'm able to comprehend. And people described it to me, but I, the half wasn't even told to me. And he is now saying the gold that covered the, 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 this beautiful, beautiful building of Solomon's temple. And the stones that he had hewn in the quarries some distance away, actually the cedar trees that he brought down from Lebanon on barges and brought through Joppa and across the land in, into Jerusalem. Those magnificent buildings that, that he built, the, the, the palace of Solomon that he built, this fortress in, of the city, it's in ruins. He, he's saying that the stones, they're poured out into every street. They're just torn down. The gold is dim. All the fine gold is gone. The precious sons of Zion, comparable to fine gold, how they are esteemed as earthen pitchers, that work of hands of the potters. The dignitaries, children that were esteemed and, and looked up to, the princesses, sons and daughters, the eloquence and the, the grandeur that they were used to and given in respect are now just considered common people among everybody else. There's no respect towards them. They're like a, like a common potter's vessel, basically worthless. If it breaks, you just buy another one. You just throw it out into the field. Even the sea monsters draw out the, the breast. They nurse their young ones. The daughters of my people has become cruel. Like the ostriches in the wilderness. The tongue of the nursing child clingeth to the roof of his mouth for thirst. The young children ask for bread and no man breaks it unto them. They, they did eat delicacies. They that fed with their, the, their dinners and their high meals and everything are desolate in the streets now. In verses 3 and 4, it talks about the children. He, he starts off the sea monsters, the, the, um, the most wildest thing that you can think of has some kind of compassion towards their young. They draw out the breasts for their young. They allow their young to nurse and feed. Even the ostrich is more considerate than the mothers have become in Israel 
towards their children. What he is saying is, is that there has become this unnatural affection, this, this, this lack of care for the children. Why? Because everybody's trying to survive. Everybody's under, a, under the siege of Babylon. They have no food. They have no water. And it says here that, that even the ostrich, in verse 3, it says... Is, is, uh, it says the daughters of the people, of God's people, have become like the ostrich. An ostrich will lay eggs, uh, they're, they're young, and then they just abandon them. Now, an ostrich will leave other eggs there besides the, uh, the eggs that they cover up, but they'll leave the others exposed and they'll allow the, the new babes to peck open the the old eggs that they have there so they can eat something once they're born and, and survive. But an ostrich will abandon their young and they don't come back and check on them. God is saying that the mothers of Israel have become that way towards their young. They give birth, but they're not caring for them. They're basically abandoning them. There's no milk for them. Nobody's giving them any bread. And so those that are wealthy, they're death, desolate in the streets, in verse 5. Those that were used to going out every night and eating and partying and having whatever they want, whenever they want. It says they're desolate in the streets. They, were, they that were brought up in scarlet, in fine clothes. Embrace dung hills now. You see the picture he's drawing? I mean, it's a hopeless picture he's, he's drawing for us, the situation that was going on in Jerusalem. For the punishment of the iniquity of the daughters of my people is greater than the punishment of the sin of Sodom. Wow, that's a heavy statement when you consider what went on with, with Sodom. But he says, The punishment of the iniquities of the daughters of my people is greater than the punishment of, of the sin of Sodom. I mean, why would he say something like that? God just demolished Sodom, and that's what he says here, that was overthrown in a moment with no hands laid on her. Her nobles were purer than snow. I mean... Um, what he is saying is the reason why their punishment was harder than that of Sodom. Sodom was destroyed like that. But it was 18 months of slow death, slow starvation, slow of, of uh, Josephus, the Jewish historian, says of this period that the Jewish people turned on themselves. They began to have uh, gang warfare in a sense, amongst themselves, uh, trying to get whatever was left, whatever was edible, whatever was drinkable from others. And it, they just turned on each other. And, and he says that punishment is greater because it was slow, not because it was fast like Sodom. Her nobles were, were purer than snow and they're whiter than milk. And he's talking about how Beautiful, the, the princes and the, the noblemen of the city were. How, they, how they, um, they were just admired um, as for their looks. More ruddy in body than, than rubies and polish, polishing was as sapphire. Just clean and shiny. And well taken care of. Their riches is is blacker, now they look blacker than cold. They are not known in the streets. Their skin clingeth to their bones. It is withered, it has become like a stick. Literally, they've just, there's no meat on them any longer. You've seen pictures of those that have lived through the Holocaust, those people that have lived through great famines in areas of of the world 
and what they look like. And once if we are able to reach them and feed them and, 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 and take care of them, how their looks change, how their body fills out and as it, the, the, the life returns back into them. They're clean and they're shiny. They've got life in their eyes and they've got muscle on their body. But basically they're just skin and bones because of the starvation. He says here in verse 9, they who are slain with the sword are better than they who are slain with hunger. He's making a, an observation here. It's better to die quickly than slowly, he's saying. He says, they, are, they that are slain with the sword are better than they that are slain with the hunger, for these pine away, stricken through, uh, through the, the lack of the fruit of the field. The hands of the, the tender-hearted woman, the hands of the tender-hearted woman, notice this, have boiled their own children. They were their food in the destruction of the daughter of my people. So he talks about the cannibalism that is going on in the city as it's being captured by the Babylonians. The Lord has accomplished his fury. Now, um, Jeremiah, as he's thinking about this, as he's dealing with this, he just utters a statement and just says, the Lord is, has accomplished his fury. His, he, he goes on and he says, he has poured out his fierce anger and he's kindled a fire in Zion and it has devoured its foundations. In the mind of the Jews, they believed that Jerusalem was untouchable. It was theirs, it was protected by God. And it was, at times, protected by God. Do you remember um, when the Assyrian army came down around and surrounded Jerusalem? Sennacherib, this Assyrian leader, king, captured, closed Hezekiah, the king of Judah, up inside of the city and says, Look, it's over with you. You might as well come out and surrender. And you remember Hezekiah turned to the Lord and began to pray. And God told Hezekiah, don't you worry about anything. There's not even going to be an arrow that's shot over the wall into this city. For the battle is mine, Hezekiah. You just sit here and wait. They went to bed that night. They rose up that morning, and you, you know the story. The angel of the Lord went out into the campment of, of the Assyrians and slayed 185,000 Assyrians. History tells us that Sennacherib, when he was writing on his frieze about this whole th thing, he says, I closed up Hezekiah like a bird in a cage. And then he doesn't say anything more. And he comes home, and history tells us that while he was in his temple praying to his God, his two sons came in and killed him out of embarrassment, and they fled into another country. And the reason why he didn't say anything more about closing up Hezekiah is because he came back without an army. God destroyed him, and the Assyrian government and Assyrian kingdom was was. A third-rate government, it was picked apart at that time, and that's what gave rise to the Babylonian Empire to take over the world at that time, the known world. And so the custom and the, the traditions that started out of that whole thing was that you don't bother with Jerusalem because God takes care of this place. He delivers Jer Jerusalem out of the hands of their enemies. And so nobody really ever tried to go against Jerusalem, and those that did were often destroyed. But here comes Babylon, and Babylon besieges the city and takes it and destroys it. It's shocking to them. And they says, God's fury is against us. Now, with us, it's hard. We, we, we have a concept about God as a God of love. 
a God of, of mercy, a God of kindness and loving kindness and tender mercies. But we also have to realize that the other side of God, in a sense, is justice, righteousness, holiness. And because of his holiness and because of his justice and because of his righteousness, sin must be dealt with. And the, for 490 years, the Israelites were given a chance to repent. 490 years. Now, can I ask you how long would you give somebody to repent? Not much. I mean, I don't give anybody time to repent if they cut me off in the freeway. <laughs> you know? I, you know, I, I, get, I get mad. And, you know, I, I have a wild and vengeful imagination. I can see what I could do. I wish my car was a tank at that time. Boom! Okay, there, you can have the front seat, you know, and stuff like that. And, and just, I, I, you know, you think about these things. <clears throat> but as we read last week, you remember, that God does not delight in disciplining his children. He does it unwillingly. That's why he takes so long to deal out his judgment. But when he does, it's swift. It's quick. And it's over with. And so the kings of the earth, in verse 12, and all the inhabitants of the world would not have believed that the adversary and the enemy should have entered into the gates of Jerusalem. There, there's the thought that they, they thought that, I mean, the, the people of the world wouldn't even consider and they wouldn't think that, that some enemy would actually overcome Jerusalem. <clears throat> For the sins of her prophets, now we're telling, now we're given the reason why. Also here, For the sins of her prophets and the iniquities of her priests that have shed the blood of the just in the midst of her. The governmental leaders and the religious leaders, the Levites, and the kings, the priests, and the kings were corrupt. And God said, that's it. And he judged them because they were shedding innocent blood of the just. They killed every one of the prophets. Remember, Jesus said, which one of you, which one of you, or, or, or which one of your fathers didn't kill the prophets? I mean, you killed him from Abel to Zechariah, from A to Z. You've killed them all. Now you're planning on killing me, he says. And they were constantly destroying and, and, and killing the prophets, the real prophets. But the false prophets were, you know, they, they've got these, these guys that, Every once in a while, I turn this guy on TV, and he's sitting there smoking a cigar and got an Indian headdress on and, or whatever, and he's telling people, I'm not going to talk until you guys give me some money. And I'm praying, Lord, don't let them give anybody any money. And I'm asking, Lord, please don't let anybody call. And... You know, people do, though. It's amazing. I don't know what it is about some people that have the tendency that likes to be verbally beaten up by religious leaders. I, I, I just can't stand when I sometimes I'll say something in a strict way to you that, hey, church, this is what God requires. This is what we need to live, live like. It, it, it troubles me sometimes when I have to say, this is what we need to be doing as a church, as a church body, a body of believers in Christ. I like telling you about the love of God and the mercy of God and the grace of God, the peace of God, the joy of the Holy Spirit. 
the gifts of the Spirit. I like talking about the Word of God and all that. But when we get onto these subjects like this about the justice and the judgment of God and, and all that, it's tough. But the leaders, the false prophets, they would never talked about the righteousness of God. They just fed the people lies, untruths, as well as the, the priests stealing the offerings and the sacrifices of the people. Well, it says here, they had wandered like blind men. This is what they were like. They were wandering like blind men in the streets. They have polluted themselves with blood so that men could not touch their garments. I mean, these men had so much blood on them. They were like leopards that cried out, saying, Depart, unclean. <laughs> depart, depart, touch me not. That's what the cry of a leper was, is when he would have leprosy, he'd have to cry out to people to tell them, Stay away from me, don't touch me. And he said that these priests and these prophets were so defiled, they were like leopards who needed to cry out. When they fled away and wandered, they said among the nations, they shall no more sojourn there. The anger of the Lord has divided them. He will no longer regard them. They respected not the, the persons of the priests, and they favored not the elders. That is Babylon, referring to Babylon. When they came into the city, they saw all these prophets. They saw the... the um, the uh, priests, and they didn't have any respect to them. They destroyed them just like anybody else. And um, which God was, was pleased to do. As for us, our eyes, he says in verse 17, as yet failed for our vain help. And in, in, in our watching, we, were, we have watched for a nation that could not save us. They're referring here to Egypt that they hired to, to come down and save them, to, or to come up and save them, to come over and, and f join leagues with them and fight against the Babylonians, but Egypt never showed. He said, they hunt our steps, they track us down, that we cannot go into the streets. Our end is near, our days are fulfilled, for our end is come. I mean, there's nowhere to hide, he says. Our persecutors are swifter than the eagles, of the heavens, they pursue us upon the mountains, they lay wait for us in the wilderness. The breath of our nostrils, the anointed of the Lord, was taken in the pits, their pits, of whom we said under his shadow we shall live among the nations. So rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Edom. And he says, he says of Edom, Edom is rejoicing. As Israel is getting plundered, the Edomites are celebrating in the streets. They're shouting, they're yelling victory because, hey, Israel's being beaten, and they're happy about it. But notice what Jeremiah says here. Go ahead and rejoice and be glad, O daughters of Edom, that dwelleth in the land of Uz. The cup also shall pass through thee, uh, unto thee. This cup of judgment is going to be passed to you. Thou shalt be drunk and shall make thyself naked. The punishment of thy iniquity is accomplished, O daughter of Zion. That is that God says, okay, I've punished you. You've been dealt with. That's it. I'm not going to draw this on any longer. And, but here he says, but he will no more carry thee away into captivity. That is that he's not going to come back over and over and over and over again. He's already done this a couple of times. And now he says... He will punish thy iniquity, O daughter of Eden. He will uncover thy sins. We've been judged, he says. You're next, Edom. And they were. Remember, O Lord, now Jeremiah finishes up here and he says, Remember, O Lord, what has come upon us. Consider and behold our reproach. Our inheritance is turned over to strangers, our houses to aliens. He, um, he says, you know, you, we work, we save, we, we put away, we, we buy homes, we, we uh, uh, invest, we do things. 
and we hopefully at the end of our lives uh, have a nice retirement, but we also are thoughtful of our own children and we hope to leave them with something uh, when we leave this earth. And we hope to be able to give our children something to help them up and so they'd have a better life than we had. And Jeremiah says that our inheritance has been stolen from us. It hasn't been given to our children. It hasn't been given to our loved ones. Our homes, he says, our houses were taken by aliens. Our and, and our inheritance was turned over to strangers. It wasn't given to our, 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 our loved ones. We are orphans and fatherless. Our mothers are like widows. The men, most of the men, were killed instantly. Of course you would do that. You don't want an army to regroup or gather. and So you kill the, the strong, the, the men that are able to fight and do them in. And so he says, we have drunk our water for money. Our wood is sold unto us. The things that we have, the, our own water, our own wood, they're selling it to us. Um, there's always, and, and really, you notice, um, you ever notice when things are bad, somebody's trying to make a nickel off of you, you know, um, in some kind of tragedy happens. There are those that will try to make money off the tragedy. Um, here it is. They, they need water, basic things. And somebody says, oh, I've got water, but it's going to cost you. And so this is what he's saying is this, what is happening to them. Our necks are under persecution. We labor and have no rest. We have given the hand to the Egyptians and to the Assyrians to satisfy or to be satisfied with bread. Our fathers have sinned and are not. They're all dead. And we have borne their iniquities. We're carrying on where they left off. Servants, he says, have ruled over us. There is none that, that does deliver us out of their hands. Basically, the, the bases of the, pe the, the, bases of, of the, of the people, the, the, the servants, are in charge now. They've been placed in charge. And they're ruthless. And they're not giving us a break. They're, not, they're, they're, they're unkind to us. I um, read a couple of commentaries that state that, that were stating that, that the, the worst rulers were the people that were servants at one time. They would come to power through assassination or whatever, and they became ruthless leaders. And here Jeremiah is saying the same thing. Servants have now ruled over us. And uh, they're ruthless. They're hard rulers. We got our bread with the pearl of our lives because of the sword of the wilderness. Our skin was black like an oven because of the terrible famine. We've lost all color in a sense, we've, we've, uh, we've turned uh, uh, this, the, the shininess, in a sense, the, the life in us is, is gone away. We're just this, this black, uh, there's no life, no, no, no radiance about us. They ravish the women in Zion. Sadly, when war is going on, the things that happen to the women is usually that they're raped by the invading armies. And this is what's happening in Zion. The women are ravished and the maids in the city of Judah. Princes are hung up by their hands. The faces, the Babylonians also practice uh, crucifixion as did the Assyrians. The Assyrians actually invented crucifixion. Uh, but there was a quick way. They, you remember how we've told you they would take a post and they would hewn it to a point, uh, hone that, that, that 
log or stick or tree into a point. They would take you and then they would, they would impale you up through the midsection with this, this post and they would impale you on a, on a tree. That's the Assyrian way. The Babylonians took it and said, let's make it a little bit longer. And so they would hang you from the tree by your hands. By the time the Romans took it over, they perfected it. And what we know is the crucifixion as Jesus went through when he died for our sins. And so he says the princes were hung up by their hands. The faces of the elders were not honored. There was no respect to the elders of the city. They took the young men to grind, and the children fell under the wood. They fell under the slavery of men. The elders have ceased from the, from the gate, the young men from their music. The elders are no longer in their gate, giving wisdom, directing, leading decisions of the city. And the young men have stopped playing their songs. There's no business going on and there's no, no songs going on. The joy of our heart is ceased. Our dance is turned into mourning. And the, glo- and the crown is, is fallen from our head. There's no glory anymore. And woe unto us that we have sinned. For this is our heart. This our heart is faint. For these things our eyes are dim because of the of mount the mountain of Zion which is desolate. The foxes are now walking upon it. Uh, the city is now ruined and the wild animals are now moving into the city. Um, basically to eat the dead rotten carcasses that are laying around. And they're scavengers, and, and they're just cleaning up the, the bones, in a sense. This was all prophesied, you remember, by Jeremiah, by Isaiah, that uh, in the Valley of Hinnom there would be so many graves that actually they wouldn't be able to bury any more people there. And so, in verse 19, he says, Thou, O Lord, remaineth forever. Thy throne from generation to generation. There's no king of Judah on the throne anymore. He's been carried away into captivity. He's been dethroned. But God, you're still on the throne. That's the only hope I see in this whole chapter, you know, really. When you think of it, God's still on his throne. And it really, when it gets right down to it, when everything is falling apart in your life, we've got to remember that is God is on his throne. Now, we need to learn to worry when God worries. Did you get that? When God worries, then you should worry. You know, never does God get up on his throne and and say, oh my gosh, oh no. You never hear him say that. You never see him go, oops, uh, or anything else like that. You never see him going, I didn't think about that. Oh, Jesus, what are we going to do about that? You know, and he's not, he's not, he's not doing anything like that. He's not worried. He's not, he's not fretting. But he's reigning on his throne. And when things fall apart, How we need to fix our eyes upon him. O Lord, thou remaineth forever thy throne from generation to generation. So why? Why then? Have you forgotten us forever and forsaken us for so long a time? Jeremiah, sitting there in in that grotto, in that cave, looking at all this and as he's watching it all unfold and remembering the last 18 months that had gone by all the devastation and destruction and the and the death he looks at that and he says it's it seemed to him like it was forever 
You know how a, a bad night seems to last forever when you're sick? It seems like a minute takes an hour. You know when your children are sick, running fever, and you're just hoping for morning so you can get them to the doctor, or you rush them to the emergency room to, to see them, and you sit there, and you sit there, and you sit there, and it feels like you've been there all week, but you've only been there for a couple hours. Or you're woken with something, and, and everything, every minute seems to go by slow. When you go to work, you're having a bad day. Then that minute, that clock, there's something wrong with that clock. I think it's broke or something like that. And you're checking your watch and saying, is it broke or something? Because time goes by slow. But when you're having fun, I mean, when everything is just great, you're on vacation, man, you go, wait a minute. I just started vacation. It's all over with. You know, kids, you know, I remember when I was in... As a kid in summer, I thought summer time was too short. I, I thought, you know, how dare them only make it three months? You know, I mean, I just got started. I just got my forts made and everything. I, I had to, and, and all that. I, I was just ready to start, and I had to go back to school and for nine more months. And I, my gosh, that's going to be forever. And, and, and it wasn't. And now I, I look at, at, at things that go by. Diane and I, we were talking about this tonight. We were talking about how everything is going by so fast. I mean, I don't know about you, but we looked at our, our month in, in August, and it's already gone. There's nothing else that we can do in that month. And we looked at, at September, and it's just like the same thing. And we're going, my goodness, everything's packed up and and. and, and we're looking down at the road and saying everything is spoken for. Time is, it seems that that minute seems to take an hour as he's saying. He said, why have you forgotten us? <laughs> I mean, the captivity is just starting. And he's acting like it's been forever. They're still being carried away into captivity. They haven't even left the area yet, and he acts like it's already been forever. When you get a cold, you think, good grief, I've had this all my life. And you've only had it for three days or something like that, you know? And I'll never be healthy again. I'll, I've been sick all my life. I know that. I, I've had this ever since I was a child. I you know, and things like that. No, it's not that true. So it, it, you've just, you've been sick for a day. You know, and, but that's how he's looking at it, how he views it. So he says in verse 21, Turn thou us unto, uh, unto thee, O Lord. You know, turn to us, turn around, look at us. And we will, and we will return, or we will be turned Renew our days as of old. Lord, restore us. Renew us and restore us. Bring us back to yourself. But thou, he says, <laughs> has utterly rejected us. And you're very angry with us. The last words that we've heard Jeremiah say, God, you're angry with us. In reality, God was broken hearted. He told them, What did I do wrong? He told them, He says, Israel, don't you remember when, when we were espoused and, and and we had that engagement period. How you used to write my name on everywhere you went, on your doorposts and on your fence and all that you wrote, wrote my name everywhere. 
I was your continuous thought. What did I do wrong that, that now you have turned from me and left me? And God was brokenhearted. You remember when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden and, and there as, as Adam and Eve was hiding in the garden, God came down into the garden in the cool of the evening, which we would like to have, a cool of the evening, and, and say, God, the Lord says, Adam, Adam, where are you? And finally, Adam came out from hiding and says, here I am. Why are you hiding? Well, we were, we were naked and we were afraid and we hid ourselves. Who told you you were naked? What have you done? And it's not a voice of an angry God. It's the voice of a broken-hearted father. It is a husband who's lost his wife. And he's broken-hearted over his loss. And he's crying out. But it is also the justice and the care of a loving father who will not allow his children to wander so far that it destroys them. You know how we are with our own children. We won't let them do things that will destroy them. Why? Because we care for them. Because we love them. We care for them too much. And so we set boundaries and rules. And God is the same way. And he says, go no farther. And when he does, he says, he warns us. He warns us. He's so patient with us. Warns us and warns us and warns us. And finally, if in our rebellion and our, our stubbornness and our refusal to re respond to his loving advice, he chastens us. And he says, all right, I must do this. Every time I got spanked by my parents, I always thought they were angry with me. And maybe they were. But I can say this, every time God has spanked me, he's never been angry with me. Disappointed? Because of my own rebellion, my own refusal to respond to his love. Because he's so faithful to tell me to stop before he ever spanks me. God doesn't like to spank his children, but he will. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens. And so, Jeremiah, his view was, God, you're angry. But no, he had already spoken through Jeremiah, and he says, can a woman forget her nursing child? She may forget, but no will I not. Your walls are ever before me. I've etched your name in the palms of my hands, he said. I will never forget you. The scripture says in, in Psalms that he says, If I forget you, Jerusalem, let my right hand fall off and my eye shrivel up. God is saying, I'll never forget you. And God says to you, to me, Matthew chapter 28, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus himself says, I'll never forget you. I'll never leave you or forsake you. I won't leave you comfortless. You'll always be with us. Amen. Amen. Father, I come before you and I thank you for your word. And I ask, Lord, that we would never get to a place in our lives that would require your chastening. Help us, Lord, to heed the conviction of the Holy Spirit that you might just lead us away from our rebellion, our iniquity. So Lord, that we might never, as a people, as a Christian, experience your displeasure. 
May we always enjoy your pleasure, Lord. Thank you.